Om Magana Timaranda Shanganangana Sadaka Chaksurun Militam Yana Taj Mai Sri Gadavana Maha Sri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Stapitam Yana Bhutale Swayam Rupakaram Mayam Dirati Swaparantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Shyam Sri Rupam Sagaritam Sahagana Raganatam Bitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Paran Sahagana Larita Shivishikan Vitam Shyam Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Srimadhi Bhakti Varanta Swami Tanamane Namaste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pacharine Nirvashesha Sanyavari Paskata De Sarani Panchatatmakam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Sharupakam Bhakta Bhattaram Bhakti Kam Namami Bhakti Shakti Kam Namo Maha Bhananaya Krishna Prem Vadayate Krishnaya Krishna Tetanya Namani Kortsami Namaha Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Taya Chajikari Taya Krishnaya Go Vinaya Namo Namaha Mangalam Bhagavan Vishnu Mangalam Guru Dadraja Mangalam Paniti Kaksho Mangalaya Tano Hari Om Narayanaya Vidmihi Vasudeva Yadimihi Tano Vishnu Pichodi Atehe O Mahadevi Chavidmihi Vishnu Padi Chadimihi Tano Lakshmi Pichodi Atehe Mahalakshmi Namastubyam Namastubyam Sare Sare Hari Pire Namastubyam Namastubyam Diyadade Tapti Kanchana Gauringi Radha Vindavani Shuri Vrishavana Sude Devi Pranamani Hari Pire Suvam Karoti Kayaram Aragam Dana Samaram Sati Buddhi Vanasana Dupa Jyoti Namostate Dupa Jyoti Dhanardhanam Dupa Jyoti Paraparam Dupa Me Paraparam Dupa Moti Dupa Vadire Namao Vishnu Paray Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shimadi Bhakti Paranta Shami Dhanamane Namaste Sari Sati Devi Gauramani Pachari Nevishesa Sanyavari Paskata Adiya Sarani Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sati Gaur Bhakta Vindam Panchatapamakam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Krishna Rupakam Bhakta Pataram Bhakti Kamaramami Shaptaram Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Well, I don't know what's going on with the Facebook feed. It seems to be frozen there. I'm not sure what I can do about unfreezing it, but uh, happy 4th of July. Good morning, Rob. Happy Independence Day. Good morning. Happy Independence Day. Any any thoughts on this uh, national holiday? <clears throat> well, what better way to celebrate our physical independence than by learning about our spiritual dependence on Krishna? Well, I'm glad you said that because the subject of our talk today is declaring our dependence. <laughs> I thought we'd depart from our usual practice of going verse by verse and... Uh, allude to a Sunday feast talk that I gave many years ago, also on the 4th of July, called Declaring Your Dependence. Not sure what's happening with Facebook. As I'm looking at the Facebook feed, seems to be, no, okay, we're, we're moving. Yeah, we're moving. We're animated. <laughs> I'll try and become even more animated as things go on. Declaration of Dependence. A lot of people, I think you'll agree with me, keep God boxed up in the church and visit him for an hour a week, it's almost a cliche to allude to that. That's the time they set aside for God. They take that hour, they pray, they sing hymns, they worship, they meditate upon God. Our, our name for God is Krishna, the all-attractive, supreme personality of Godhead. However, after they exit the church, <clears throat> then they go home, they watch a football game, they feast on dead flesh, they maybe wash it down with some alcohol. They go to work on Monday morning and uh, gone. Whatever they learned, whatever their aspirations, whatever reasons they had for going to church, hopefully some of them were beyond the temporary material gains, are put in the background of their mind. Now, these are church-going people. They aspire for righteousness. They pay lip service to a God-centered life. They would like to love God or Krishna. They certainly reverence him, but they think, and this may sound familiar to you, there's nothing spiritual about the morning commute. There's nothing spiritual about going to the grocery store, cooking dinner, meeting with a client, paying the bills. Krishna or God lives far, far away in his spiritual kingdom and could not possibly have an interest in or knowledge of our day-to-day -day life. One example that people give is they compared God to a, 
a watchmaker. He creates the universe. He fills it full of potential energy. Metaphorically speaking, he winds it up, packs it full of energy, potential energy, and then he leaves it to its own resources. He leaves it to tick, 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 and then has nothing more to do with it. Well, our message today is that Krishna, God, is not just far away, but he's fully present within your heart. He's fully present within each and every atom. In that all-pervasive feature, he's known as the Paramatma. He's aware of every single detail of your life. He knows what you're doing at the office. He knows what you're doing at the gym. He knows what you're cooking for dinner. He knows how many hairs there are on your head. I heard a story one time about a little tiny boy, just uh, one or two years old, playing in a sandbox. The sandbox had a lip. It had a wooden, like four by, uh, probably um, one by fours around the edge of it. Somewhere other, a rock had gotten in there. The little boy was trying to expel that rock. So he would get with his little muscles and chubby little arms and legs, he would get the rock up just to, just about ready to go over the lip and then it would fall back. He did that once. He did that twice. He did it three times. Finally, his, his arms were tired. His legs were tired. He was frustrated, upset. He began crying. A shadow fell over the little kid. He looked up. There was his dad. His dad said, son, you didn't, what are you, what are you upset about? And he said, I can't get this stone out of my sandbox. Yeah, I tried and tried and tried. The father said, but you didn't avail yourself. You didn't take advantage of all the strength that was available to you. And the little boy said, I did, I did, I did, I did. I used everything I had. The father said, no, you didn't take advantage of all the strength that was available for you because you didn't ask me. And then he reached in and very easily extracted the, stone from the sandbox. But Krishna, imagine a shadow following you wherever you go, but you're not interested. You're absorbed in your own plans, running about with your temporary projects. Um, the Krishna's benign, loving shadow is always over us. He's asking you if you'd like wisdom for making better decisions. He's asking you to take his strength to overcome your enemies, to expel those rocks from your life which are unwanted. Krishna would like nothing more than for you to open up to the strength and the wisdom, the power and the love that he's prepared to unleash. And he'll 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 harness that power to help you manage your career, manage your family, manage your health, fulfill your dreams. God is asking you, knocking at the door. He could break the door down. He could slam you against the kitchen table with your arm twisted behind your back and force you to do the best things, to make the right decisions in your life. But he will never, ever do that. He wants you to voluntarily open up <clears throat> And let him fill you with his power, his light, his love, his knowledge. Let him transform you after his image so that you then also can be a beacon of light and love to your family, to your co-workers. And ultimately, he can not only manage your life in the optimal way in this lifetime, but at the end of this life, he's willing to take you back home, back to God. But here's the key. Krishna will only be involved in your life as much as you will let him. He will only be involved in as much of your life as you will allow. If you allow him a little, then he'll only be involved a little. If you allow him much, then he will be involved much. If you turn every aspect of your life, if you acknowledge God in all your activities, not just in church, but in your finances, in your family, in your marriage, in your sports, in your health, then he will crown your life with success and make you an example to others in every area of your life. How do you do that? 
Sounds like a big order. Well, the longest journey starts with one step. Ata Sri Krishna Namadi Nabavedgar Shevan Mukhi Jivano Shayam Mevasparaj starts with this the rudder of your ship, little fleshy thing inside of your mouth called the tongue, the jiva. Atashi Krishna Namadi. If you honor the Lord by chanting his holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Srinbatam Shrakata Krishnam, Punya Sravanu Kirtanam. When you, when you let the Lord in by chanting his holy names, you invite him to dance on the tip of your tongue. You invite him to illuminate all the dark nooks and crannies of your heart with transcendental light. You're saying, in effect, when you chant, Lord, I don't want any more to keep you at arm's distance. I don't want you remotely involved in my life. I want you to come in and take over every aspect of my life. Take over my thinking. Take over my feeling. Take over my willing. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. O oh Lord, O oh energies of the Lord, I don't want you in a compartment. I don't want you in a, a box anymore. I don't want you on the edge anymore. I don't want you just to be a resident of my heart. I want you to be the present of my heart. The greatest, in my opinion, <clears throat> Christian bhakti poetess was Frances Havergal. Tell me if you don't think this is a message of pure bhakti. Take my life, Lord, and let it be consecrated to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of my love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my lips and let them sing. Always and only for my king. Take my mouth and let it be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect, use every power thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet, it's treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. If you are ever only all for him, and the Supreme Lord, creator of millions of universes, the master of mystic powers, your loving Father will be forever only all for you. You have to take your might and dedicate to him, and then he takes his, you take your might, M-I-T-E, which is an old English word meaning something very small. You take your might, and you use your might ever only all for him, he takes his might, M-I-G-H-T, Almighty Lord takes his might, and he uses that ever only all for you. Such a deal. Such a deal. You pass up a deal like this, what can they say? What can I say? Just crudely imagine someone offering you a million dollars, and you have only five dollars to your name. So how unfortunate would be the person who says, I'm not giving up this $5. You wouldn't give up $5 even for a million dollars? Nope, I'm keeping on this $5. It's mine. But you reason to this person. There's so many $5 in a million dollars. But still that person is so pathetic, so stubborn, so obstinate. No, it's my $5 I'm keeping Someone who fails to take advantage in the above-mentioned ways of the human form of life, to take, fails to take advantage, who fails to trade his might, M-I-T-E, for the God's might, is like that person that won't give up their $5, even in exchange for a million dollars. I joined the temple in 1970 in Australia. Prior to 1970, I'd been traveling all over the world. I had pages and pages of visas from all the countries I'd been. Scotland, England, France, Spain, Canary Islands, Israel, Turkey, Albania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Afghanistan, Iran, India, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, 
Indonesia. And finally, I came to Australia in 1970 after three years of traveling. And I just needed to get more money so I could continue my travels. But interestingly enough, Krishna had a different plan in mind. One day, coming home from work from a construction site in North Sydney, I met a devotee named Upendra. As luck would have it, <clears throat> uh, the place that these newly arrived missionaries of Krishna consciousness had rented for the temple was just within easy, easy walking distance from where by Bobby and I had rented an apartment. We went to the programs Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Not every Monday and Wednesday and Friday, but a couple times a week. And <clears throat> we developed a habit of going to the Sunday feast. <clears throat> So after six months of working and earning money and attending the temple, I finally realized that I wanted to do the inner journey. I was tired of skimming the surface of countries and culture. I wanted to get deep into the process of self-realization. So we decided we would join the temple. Now, when I joined the temple, I thought I was giving up travel. I traveled unrestrictedly for three years all over the world. And I thought that such a noble person as I was, that I was going to give up travel and be cloistered in a monastic-like setting for the rest of my life. <clears throat> well, within, I think I joined the temple around May of 1970. By 1971, I was on my way to India for the first of 20 voyages to India. Prabhupada liked it that at least once a year, all the leaders temple presidents and managers would go to India to gather together and enjoy the Sangha in the Holy Dham of Sri Mayapur where Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started the Hare Krishna movement 500 years ago. So I was not only fortunate enough, but as a senior manager, I was obliged. It was my duty to go to India every year from about 1973 to 1983. And sometimes I had to go twice a year. So here I thought that I was giving up travel in order to join the temple and yet, that was not at all the case. Krishna continued to allow me to travel, but now with purpose, with meaning. And I'd been to India before becoming a devotee. It wasn't a particularly memorable experience. I didn't make any notable connections, spiritually or materially. But then the next time I went to India, I was wearing tilak on my forehead, a korta, dhoti. And it opened up the whole culture. People would come up to you on the street and ask you, how you as a Westerner born with a silver spoon in your mouth came to Krishna consciousness, invite you home, they offer you dinner. It just opened every door in India, coming back as a devotee. So little did I realize when I joined that it, wouldn't, it wasn't closed doors, but my joining opened doors I could have never dreamed of or imagined. This is the nature of Krishna. You give up a little, you give up your might, M-I-T-E, and then he transfers his might, M-I-G-H-T, to you. This is exhibited in his relationship with the gopis, the topmost devotees of the Lord, when he descended from the spiritual world and exhibited his pastimes 5,300 years ago in India. Descending along with him were his most intimate devotees, the gopis, the cowherd maidens of Vrindavan. And the gopis gave up everything. When Krishna played his flute at midnight during the full moon, season in the autumn in the autumnal season during the full moon <clears throat> the gopis were at sleep in their beds behind their husband they had their children or if they were unmarried uh, they were watched over very carefully by their parents they were chaperoned to make sure that they would be chased for their future husbands but when the gopis heard krishna's flute they abandoned their children they abandoned their husbands they snuck out like teenagers do, <laughs> snuck out through the second story window and climbed down the tree. They all went, no matter what the consequences, you know, they were committing social suicide, especially in that day and age with all the tradition, all the protocol. They were committing social suicide by going to Krishna in the middle of the night. And yet they didn't even consider the downside. They didn't even consider the negatives. They, threw it all overboard, jettisoned every cultural consideration, risked the censor and the condemnation of society in general to go and heed the call of Krishna's flute in the forest at midnight. And in the 
face of that surrender. Gopis were cowherd maidens living in a rural village. They didn't have much. They had mites, M-I-T-E. But whatever might they had, they tendered it at Krishna's lotus feet. And because of their full-hearted, total, complete surrender, they held nothing back. Krishna, for his part, held nothing back also. He said, Krishna was done to see all the gopis showing up in response to the call of his flute. He was stunned. He said, nah, but I, hum, I don't find any comparison to the level of your surrender in all of history and all of creation. In fact, your surrender is so impressive that I, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, with all the resources, having created millions and millions of universes, every opulent, beautiful creation in millions and millions of worlds has its origin in Krishna. And Krishna said, if I were to commandeer all those opulences, tender with your lotus feet, it would not discharge my debt to you, the simple cowherd maidens of Vrindavan. He says, and if I were to continue tendering, continue trying to reciprocate with gifts and land, wealth and jewels, and children, and whatever, if I were to continue to shower all of my resources upon each and every one of you, even for as long as a day of Brahma, which is a long time, I would still never reach the end of my indebtedness to you. Krishna himself illustrated in an unambiguous, unequivocal way that if you're for him, he will be for you. And whenever you acknowledge him, he always reciprocates. He always acknowledges the acknowledgement. He notices and appreciates any service. Even a little advancement in devotional service. What to speak of surrender on the level of the gopis. Even a little advancement. Even people who come to the Sunday feast one time and just as a lark chant Hare Krishna with the devotees. That little advancement that non-envious attitude, that sympathetic attitude towards the Sankirtan movement of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saves you, Trayate Matoba, saves you from so much danger. And it begins the process of Krishna showing up more and more in your life. It, it, uh, it triggers the breeze of Krishna's favor in your life. You still may be doing sinful activities. You still may be nonsense number one. But because you have that little bit of Krishna conscious to your credit, there's a little breeze. It may not be enough of a breeze to make significant changes, but if you go back and drink from that top again, if you quaff those healing waters again, if you empower yourself by visiting a temple a second, a third, or fourth time, like I did 50 years ago in Australia, that, that wind of Krishna's favor gets a little brisker, gets a little more robust. Eventually, if you keep up this process, It'll open doors. It'll bring you the right connections. Life will go so much easier when you develop the habit of acknowledging Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It is said things that should have been a struggle when you acknowledge Krishna, those things won't be a struggle anymore. Other things that shouldn't have been a struggle when you forget Krishna, they get hard. <laughs> on this 4th of July 2022 I think we have to bring Abraham Lincoln into the equation Abraham Lincoln was a God conscious person I'd like to share these inspirational words from the then president of our country on the occasion of the Independence Day commemoration he said it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence, dependence, I say, upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow. You have to admit, Abraham Lincoln certainly had a way with words. 
And when those words are used to honor and glorify the Supreme Personality of God, it's the perfect perfection. You know, Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest orators in the history of our country. And when that oration, that oratorial talent, ability is used to honor God, there's nothing. That's a perfection of life. Um, the Lord is meant to be worshipped with articulation, with good, broad vocabulary, with heartfelt, deep devotion. Now tell me whether these words meet those criteria. Yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. We know that by His divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as whole people. You got to love this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. This is, you know, 1860s. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But, Abraham Lincoln says, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God who made us, end quote. If you just joined us, that was Abraham Lincoln, not only the past president of our country, but one of the greatest orators of all history, and not only the past president, not only one of the greatest orators of our history, but a deeply God-conscious person. And Prophet also, during the early years, he's said to have been giving a lecture, I think in Berkeley, California, and one upstart student raised his hand and challengingly asked, we have so many churches, so many temples, so many denominations, and what if, what have you come to add? What have you come, what could you possibly add to the fact that we have Episcopals, we have Lutherans, we have Methodists, we have Catholics, we have so many churches and denominations? Prabhupada shot right back at him. As forcefully as the question had been tendered, Prabhupada said, I have come to teach what you have forgotten God. That's exactly what Abraham Lincoln said also. We've become so caught up in all of the successes and prosperity that God has blessed us with that we have ceased to recognize the hand of the Creator in all of that. It says, Makchita mai gara prana bodhiyashina kataya tashchamamnitam tishanti chara manticha. Now on the other side of the pole, on the other um, side, it is said, Machita Magara Prana Bodhyanta Those who are on the progressive spiritual path, back to home, back to Godhead, they never forget the Lord. There's not a moment when they don't acknowledge the Lord. Madhana Madgara Shara Prana Bash Bodhyanta Tushanti Chara Mantiham. Pure devotees of the Lord, genuine devotees of the Lord are so addicted to the waters of Krishna's holy name, form, fame, and pastimes, that they never forsake them. They never abandon them even for a moment. Their lives are fully devoted, satitam kirti antumam, to the chanting and hearing and discussing and remembering of the glories of the tushanti chara mantichat. Why? 
Why they spend all this time in connection with God? Because they achieve great satisfaction and bliss. Katayantashchimamnyatam by enlightening one another and conversing amongst themselves about Lord Krishna. It doesn't mean to spend 24 hours a day on your knees, to never get up, to never go vertical, to never go to work. <laughs> well, we're talking about an attitude of dependence, an attitude of acknowledgement that at least under our breath, in our thoughts, we are constantly meditating upon and thanking the Lord for his kindness, for his generosity, for his goodness. We're meditating on his promises for the future. We're reviewing all the times in the past when he got us through. And we're excited about the breakthroughs that are up there in front of us. We're reviewing scriptural quotes. We're molding our thinking and feeling and willing to coordinate, to harmonize with the words of the scripture. And we're asking for his help in all things. It's a lifestyle. It becomes so ingrained. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. That anything you do automatically, Krishna's name bubbles to the forefront of your consciousness. You include God in every aspect of your life, no matter how trivial you think it might be. So our exhortation on this 4th of July morning is to declare your dependence on God. Don't flaunt independence. It's not a good practice. Don't go through the next 20 years of your life trying to do everything, trying to take credit for every success, blaming every failure on God. Someone once said the most sublime prayer that we can ever utter in any language under any circumstances is this prayer. Help! 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 Our message is that if you'll acknowledge Krishna before you go into that meeting, Lord, help me to keep my cool and not say anything I'll regret. If you'll acknowledge Krishna before you go into the gym. Lord, if I'm going to work out, let this be the best workout I could possibly have. Acknowledge Krishna before you give that presentation. Yes, you stayed up all night. You know that PowerPoint by heart. But still, Lord, I need your help to give it that extra something. If you develop the lifestyle of acknowledging the Lord before you take that exam, Lord, help me to have, I studied diligently, but help me to have the recall that I need. Help me not to freeze up when it matters the most. If you acknowledge Krishna before you return home after a hard day's work, Lord, help me not to take out my frustrations on my family. Ten seconds before you work, open the door and say, Hi, honey, I'm home. Say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Lord, I need your help. I need your blessings. I can't do it without you. Thank you that I'm not meant to travel this journey of life on my own. Without this practice of inviting Krishna into every area of your life, the days of your life are not going to be what they could have been. Lord, I realize that this day is not going to be as productive, not going to be as successful, not going to be as fruitful, not going to be as easy as it could have been without my evoking your blessings and favor. Trinata peace in each and amani namana dana kirtan yasara. Lord Jitani Mahaprabhu said, make a garland of these words around your neck. Feeling yourself lower in the straw in the street, more uh, tolerant of all, uh, uh, without any false prestige, giving respects to all of the living beings, taking a straw in between your teeth is a sign of humility. In such a state of mind, one can chant the, const the names of the Lord constantly. 
night and day by constant recitation, chant the great names without hesitation, feeling free from temptation with the sensation of feeling yourself lower in the straw in the street, more tall than the tree, devoid of all sense of false prestige. In such a state of humility, one can chant the Lord, the name of the Lord eternally. Lord, you created me from your own essence, mamaya vamsa, jive loke. Each and every one of us, when we first saw the light, when we first exited the womb of our mother, we had a great hunger. There was something we wanted to taste. We weren't sure what it was. And indeed, in the breast of the mother prior to giving birth, there's only blood. But the moment that birth comes, magically, mystically, the blood within the breasts of the mother turns into life-giving, sweet, tasty, creamy milk. And in that milk are all the uh, immune system boosters that the baby needs, vulnerable and tiny and as susceptible as it is. And that milk is not only calories and nourishment, but there is the protection inbuilt within that milk from all kinds of disease, bacteria, and viruses. That milk is packed full of health-giving liquids. Lord, thank you that I could not have even survived the first minute of my life had you not transform the blood within the breast of my mother into life-giving, protective milk. Consider the case of Arjuna. Arjuna was totally baffled. He didn't see a way out of his predicament. He, did. He, he thought, if I turn left, it's a problem. If I turn right, it's a problem. He felt himself blocked up, trapped, bound hand and foot. Therefore, he did the right thing. He acknowledged Krishna. He acknowledged Karpanya Dosho Pataha Shova Pichami Dum Dum Yaksriyas in Nishira Buritanme. Sishis Teham Sarimam Tram Praparam. I am confused. My mind is reeling. I've dropped my bow. I'm shaking. I'm trembling. Tears have come from my eyes. I cannot solve this dilemma on my own. Therefore, Krishna, I ask you to be my guru. Let's end the friendly talks as if we're equals. Now I'm submitting myself to you as your disciple. Karpanya dosho pada. Sishas teham san prapita. Please instruct me how to get out of this situation. And after the 700 words of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna perked up, put his shoulders back, put his head high, picked up his Gandiva bow, put a smile on his face, and he said, Nashta Mohashmitu. Thank you, Krishna, because you poured knowledge, you poured wisdom. You poured strength. You poured love into me. I am now no longer suffering from confusion and lack of power. Nashta I am full of remembrance. I'm full of recollection. I'm, 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 I'm aware of your unlimited mercy upon your children. I'm aware of the fact that nothing happens without your sanction. I'm, I know that you're here for a reason and i Fully give myself over to be your instrument in this world. I want to be your instrument to fulfill your vision for the world. And in that humble state of mind, after which Arjuna had submitted himself to the Lord, the Lord gave him wisdom. He cleared the clouds of confusion and he made everything crystal clear. Why did he do that? Because Arjuna had shown a complete level of acknowledgement and dependency of Krishna. And when you give, give yourself, get yourself right in the middle of what Krishna wants for your life, get totally in agreement with the Lord, there's nothing he wouldn't do for you. Because Arjuna was uh, submissive, pliant to the will of Krishna. Krishna brought Arjuna from one side of the dangerous battlefield of Kurukshetra, now, there were, there were four million soldiers on the other opposing army, and every one of them knew that if they were to bring Arjuna down, Arjuna was the champion of the Pandavas. He was the beacon of righteousness. He was the one on whom all good people were pinning their hopes. And the opposite soldiers, every cowerman, every elephant rider, every infantryman, every charioteer knew if he could bring Arjuna down with an arrow, with a javelin, with a spear, with a sword, then their side would waltz to victory. So in spite of the fact that four million 
opponents. We're focused uh, on killing Arjuna above and beyond any other member of the Pandava army. Still, Krishna made such an arrangement that not only was Arjuna safely transported through the 18 days of the Kurukshetra War, but his brothers as well, they were not harmed, but all of the four million soldiers who sought to do harm to Arjuna, Krishna got payback. None of them went home to see their wives. Never for any of them did their kids ever again sit on their knees. Of course, Krishna is father of all living beings. And even if you're misbehaving, Krishna will still seek to get you to where you need to be. And so those soldiers who lost their lives, getting the darshan, seeing Krishna on the battlefield, got a lot of liberation from their sins. They got a type of liberation. But let me just conclude with this assurance to you and anyone who might tune into these podcasts, Facebook Live presentations in the future, in case the thought has crept into your mind, let me assure you that dependency on God is not a weakness. Dependency on God is the greatest strength you can have because that dependency, that acknowledgement is what activates his power in his life. Don't be proud thinking that I don't need you in this area, Krishna. If you have that attitude, Krishna will step back and he'll let you deal with it on your own. Never will Krishna force himself into your life. We have to cultivate a pattern of behavior where we depend on the Lord. And that dependence doesn't mean now and then. You know, we like to do things our way, and then when we inevitably get into trouble, then we ask Krishna to come and bail us out when we're in trouble. That's not the meaning of dependence. Dependence on Krishna means continual action in every area of your life. At every moment, from morning to evening, through every day and month and year of your life, Krishna, help me. Krishna, I can't do it alone. I need your wisdom, I need your strength, and I need your love. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So that's our message today on this 4th of July, 2022. I hope that you found it appropriate. I hope that it spoke to you. What's your opinion, Rob? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Um, this is a wonderful talk today um, because what I've found is, you know, it takes an openness and willingness to surrender fully and to realize that we're powerless over our existence and that the only way to overcome that is to surrender to Krishna and to become dependent on Krishna. And through that, we can become independent of Maya. Excellent. How well we've seen the last couple of years, how a tiny, invisible, microscopic virus can bring down, <laughs> cripple all of our so-called advancement and affluence. And so we've had a really good case in point the last couple of years. And if that doesn't make it clear that we have to cling to. We have to seek the shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna for the solution of all our problems then I'm not sure. I'm not sure what could wake people up. But Krishna is always working in such a way as to try to bring us into his loving embrace but we have to take the step on our own. Krishna is not going to do for us what we can do for ourselves. So thanks very much for those comments. See who we have on board today by Bobby. She's giving clapping hands. That might mean she approves of what we say. Anjali says, yes, dependency on God is not a weakness. Anjali is one of the strongest people I know. So that's a good endorsement from her. Krishna gets payback. Indeed, he does. Anjali is declaring herself grateful on this morning. Britta, we had a nice visit Saturday night when she and Alexander came to the feast. I sat through the lecture and uh, we took dinner together, reminisced about our relationship, which is probably about, goes back 30 years or so. I think Britta was probably just out of high school when she first came to the temple with her friend. Um, 
She says, by the way, that's so true. We take credit for everything positive and we blame God for all the negative. And it's totally the other way around. Yeah, well, flip that. We should, we, should give, we should take blame for all the negative and we should give God credit for all the positive. Because <laughs> usually when there's a negative, it's our own doing. But if you're a devotee, even negative circumstances, you see the hand of God in that. Anjali emphasizes before you go to the gym, before you go to a meeting, before you go to that workout, before you go to the exam, before you go to that presentation, ask Krishna for help. Hare Krishna. Okay. Anjali is the queen of comments. He, she quotes again after me. Abraham Lincoln, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, but we have forgotten God. Anjali has a lot of quotes. Janatari, thanks for joining us. Radhe, Radhe. Anjali, again, again. Yes, all these quotes, um, these prolific quotes from Anjali and as many quotes as you like to put on in the time we have remaining will help us boost us up in the algorithms of Facebook and give more people the opportunity to access the messages of Bhagavad Dharma. Anjali's got so many quotes, it would take me another 45 minutes to read them. And that's not a criticism, that's a praise. We love it, Anjali, we love it. And also, you know, um, if I have any retention of the knowledge of philosophy, it's because I always took notes. So you can see throughout the whole course of the talk, Anjali's taking notes and she's posting his comments. That's the way to deeply retrain, retain. That's the way to embed the knowledge when it flows from your ears through and then to your hands and typing. At least I can say that's my secret so far as it goes. William Griffith, thank you for rejoining us. Brent, Brent was here at the Sunday feast. I had the opportunity to chat with Govinda Dave also on Saturday night in Salt Lake City. Natasha, um, hope you caught the broadcast last night. We had a lot of fun talking about how you choose to live. And Jean never messes, never misses a message, never misses a message. So thanks everyone. Once again, it's the 4th of July. Enjoy your day with the family, with the public, whatever your plans are. Remember, acknowledge Krishna in everything at every moment. Declaring our dependence on God on this special day, 2022. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Rama, Hare Hare.